Thank you all for getting here so early. I'm very impressed with the turnout. I was thinking of taking a register to see who, who my real friends are. Um, <laughs> thank you to Typo Labs for having me back. I enjoyed it last year, and I'm enjoying it very much again this year. So that's great. Um, so what am I going to talk about? Uh, as for how far can we go? I, my theme was how far can we go beyond our little community of font people and to talk to web designers. I've been learning a lot more about the web and CSS myself, which has been really interesting. From being a, just a tinkerer, I've um, learned a fair bit more in the last uh, 18 months, and that's been, that's been really interesting. Um, so what is the point? That's, it is one of the big deals about variable fonts is how small they are, and, one of the, and the big reason to make fonts small is, is the web. There's a some other reasons you want to make fonts small for putting on small on devices, but the web is, um, by and large, the the reason we want to make fonts small and talk to um, talk to web people about them about these things. And there hasn't been enough discussion, but enough talking between these two communities in the past. And so that's what I that's the reason for this talk and why I've been talking to, to these people to 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 them much more than I have before. But so that's the point. What is a point? I think in this room, more people know what a point is, probably to three decimal places with various different uh, definitions of what a point is than uh, any other room in this city, uh, maybe apart from Eric Speakerman's uh, uh, studio. Um, and it's around, it's around 172nd of an inch. Um, and we use points to specify type. This is. Uh, uh, page of type spec, we, we call it, from the around 1986. Mark Simonson was kind enough to give me this page. It's a, it's a typewriter text telling the typesetter, in this case a photo typesetter, which type to use, what point sizes. Um, it, so there's uh, some typewritten stuff in the middle with lots of handwritten notes. It's a bit of a mess. But this, is, this makes sense to the, to the type guy who will produce a photographic um, print, a bromide to return by courier, motorcycle courier or something, back to Mark for him to cut and paste onto his layout. So this is specifying type, specking type in the 80s. Of course, being Mark Simonson, that isn't really a typewriter. That's his own bitmap font that he uh, produced on, on his Mac. So you all knew what a point was. What is an FR unit? How many people here know what an FR unit is? Five. OK. Um, <laughs> I suggest FR units are just as important as points, and you all should um, look up what they are, because they're, they're really cool. Um, there are more units that are used on the web. Um, the last three or four are fairly recent introductions. The, R the REM is relative, um, relative. Is it relative, Chris? Relative M size? Yeah, so this is a, a, a root or root. You set up the root M, and then every other definition of font size is, is relative to that, to that root M, M size. VW, that's a viewport width, so that's the, however wide your window is. Um, you can do things in, in relation to the width of the, of the window. VH, viewport height. FR is fractional of the remaining thing. So after you've set up your widths of various parts in your web page, the FR in, in a grid that you've set up is the remaining parts. It's really, really useful. Um, so one of the reasons I started uh, going beyond the bubble, as it were, was, is, is expressed in this thing I tweeted, I think, towards the end of Typo Labs last year. And I didn't notice any front-end developers, so CSS people, people who are obsessed with JavaScript. I didn't notice any of them. So I tweeted this. One person, um, Mika Rich, I don't know him. Is he, is he here in the audience? But that's one person who replied and said hello. So if he's out there, I'll say hello again, and hello to all the the web developers uh, in the audience. And it's good to see Chris and Leah and, um, and Jason and a few others. That's, that's really good to see. Um, at the end of last year, I was invited to give a talk at the .CSS conference in Paris. Um, and the reaction to that was really, up, um, really rewarding, how many people reacted even to the geekier bits in my talk. It was almost especially the geeky bits. They really lapped it up. And everything, I, I didn't feel I'd gone far enough even in, in, in geeking them out, in geeking out in front of them. They really loved hearing from the font world. 
Um, so I, I, and this is how I presented the font world to them. This is how, how I presented it in the past. So you know, type foundries and readers on the right with typographers and printers mediating between them. Then there was a DTP era where the printer wasn't, you didn't need to think about the printing so much. And then nowadays, with, with uh, publishing on the web, you have font makers on the, on the left there, end users on the right, and the designer, CSS wizard, sometimes the same person, uh, mediating between them. And so, that, so these, these worlds, I felt, needed a sort of ambassador, missionary, whatever you call it. Uh, I'm not sure that was quite the right um, idea, but that's, I felt we needed to, needed to talk. And I told them this, I, I, which I genuinely believe, I think is the most exciting time in typography for a long time. Uh, at the end of the talk, I told them this, that the, you, the CSS people, are the most important typographers working today. Again, I think that's, I think that's definitely true. Um, so in 2010, this happened. So we all know a little bit about CSS, that Fontface was introduced for, uh, for, web, for remote web fonts. And people went around conferences, Tim Brown, Elliot J. Stocks, Jason Santa Maria, giving wonderful talk, inspirational talks about how, how wonderful this is. And that was, I think, the last time many of us checked out what was going on in CSS. But there's, there's been a fair, fair bit more happening since that time. Um, and some people trace it back to this talk, again in 2010, Ethan Marcotte, a DAO of flexibility. And in, in this talk, he introduced the concept of uh, responsive web design, RWD, and it's a, still a great watch, that, that talk. Um, and the idea was we no longer have the right to assume anything about the device we're publishing to. So it's a tiny screen or a giant screen. Our websites, our publishing has to respond to, the, to those devices. Uh, and back in 2010, it was a lot of so-called media queries. We'd ask uh, what kind of device this is, how wide is our um, device, and if it's smaller than a certain width, we'd switch to a switch to a different a different layout. That has changed a little bit with the idea that variation is every, is everywhere. Everything is more fluid, so there's a much more fluid change between the the wide and the narrow screens. Um, here's something I showed in Paris again. This is the Dropbox design language that was introduced uh, that was shown last year. There's a tons on that page that is responding as you make the page narrower, including the type itself. It's selecting a different, uh, a different font as the, as, the, as the page gets narrower. That's not a variable font, and that's using dozens of fonts to achieve that effect, so it's not very efficient. Um, but there is a variable version of that font, and of course it would make great sense in this case to Maybe if that was the only text you're using, subset the font and use it, make it variable. That would then be a tiny, tiny little font file, a single, a single font file, instead of the 20 or so that are being used. So variable fonts are just one of the many ways CSS has, be has been getting variable. I'll just mention a few. They're CSS variables themselves. They're, um, they are uh, properties that are uh, prefixed with this hyphen hyphen thing at the top there. So you set up a variable just once, what, what your main background color is in this case, and then you can use that later on as many times as you like. So if you want to change your background color, you just change it once. And this is CSS copying what was already going on these, in these so-called so CSS preprocessors like SAS and um, SCSS, things like that, that um, people that were becoming popular, some of these things had to get into, made their way into CSS itself. There's a thing called CSS Calc, which is for doing little calculations in, inside, uh, in, inside your CSS. You can combine them, CSS variables and, and calc. So here we're setting up a variable, it, these three width variables, and then doing some calculations with them. Not everything is in CSS itself. Here, the concept of CSS locks is not a CSS native concept, but uh, um, Tim Brown thought of, uh, invented the idea um, and he's a great communicator. So the idea of CSS locks looks like it might be having some traction. The idea is you have a minimum and a maximum uh, value if you want something to change. Then you have to work out some maths about how to vary it, how to interpolate it, interpolate it from the minimum to the maximum. The coolest thing of all, though, uh, apart from variable fonts, is uh, display grid. So this is a new display mode for any little bo any box you have 
in a website. You say display grid as your CSS, and you've, um, it, it's really a wonderful way of, of setting up a typographic grid. For some reason, the word typo typography and typo typographic are not used that much in the CSS world. It's usually layout. Um, but to us, uh, we should think of it as this is a typographic grid that is being set up with um, numerous wonderful ways of uh, having each part of that grid deform and expand. Uh, Rachel Andrew was, uh, has been for many years giving great talks, promoting the idea of it, and then as it became implemented, continuing to, to spread the word. Here's her book about it. Uh, more recently, uh, Mandy Michael has been giving fantastic videos in this series she calls Layout Land. Uh, sorry, Mandy Michael, did I say that? Jen Simmons, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I do recommend you check them out. Uh, this super simple video is called Flexibility in the Fold. It's just setting out this super simple image, title, and menu bar. But she explains the detail of how each part of that deforms. So I should have made a little video of this, but she, her, her narrative of how, that, how to set, that up, set up that web page, how it all deforms beautifully, is, is really, really inspiring. And it's really type, typography. This is. This is typography today. Uh, the pace of changes of CSS has increased significantly, and that's down probably more than anything else to the security fears of users and browser makers. So everyone, by default, has auto-update switched on. So browsers are getting these, these new features without ever, ever, anyone having to say, update me. So this is typography. I think, it, sorry, to, uh, with apologies to Jan uh, Chichold, I think this is what typography is. This is what we, th we should think of as where the cutting edge of typography is. And we spec it, not by uh, scroll scrolls and typewriters, but we spec it by writing CSS. Rich Rutt has written a great book on, on how to do that. So this is all about how to use CSS to spec type on the web. This is, uh, how, this is a detailed look at the web inspector inside Firefox that's coming very soon. Uh, Jason showed a preview of this yesterday. So you can see the CSS of the current page. Um, you don't, wouldn't normally author CSS in this, but this is a way to inspect what's happening. And, and, people do t and developers do tend to spend a lot of time with this, in this inspect window open, um, editing things, checking things out. And on the right there is the new variable fonts panel. So if, you, if you've linked to a variable font, you can look at all the instances inside it, play with the sliders, and you'll get a font variation settings string ready to use. You don't need to type it anymore. Um, Rich Rutter added what I think of as a kind of appendix to his book, which is uh, how to use web fonts in the real world, how to use variable fonts in the real world. And it turns out, it, you know, no matter what people like me said about how easy it's going to be, in practice right now it's, it's a little bit trickier, but so it's really great to have that out there as well, I recommend it if you're thinking of deploying, deploying variable fonts. Um, the other resource I think is really important at the moment is, is CodePen. Um, it's one of many uh, CSS web playgrounds. Uh, there's, there's a few others, but for some reason this I think is, is all the rage at the moment, and I think it's due to its, uh, it's, it's designed really beautifully. Here's uh, Leah Veru, she's putting lots of experiments up on this, uh, up on CodePen. I don't know how many she's got, probably several hundred, exploring different aspects of, of CSS. And she put up this uh, variable fonts demo in her framework uh, Mavo, which is a HTML extension that allows you to manipulate data and so on, and um, retrieve, manipulate, store data on, on the web. You notice, how you know, the layout of the page is HTML window on the top left, CSS in the middle, and JavaScript on the right. So those are the three languages you're thinking about all the time as a web developer. If that right, top right window is empty, there's a feeling that web developers, CSS people, have a sort of rush of, yes, it's empty, I think. That if you're, if you're, if you're a JavaScript geek, you, you're, you're happy to write all this code, but there's a big separation in web developers' minds about do I need to implement, implement this in JavaScript or not? So if you can keep that JavaScript window empty, and the, the great thing is CodePen by default will just show you an empty window. It won't just reflow the page. Just to emphasize that you've succeeded. You've done this page without JavaScript. Uh, in variable fonts, um, so more um, 
these tiny little experiments that you can just take a look at how one particular effect was done. The code pen is particularly useful for. Uh, Mandy Michael, at the beginning of this year, was putting up lots of wonderful experiments involving lots of other new, new CSS, like um, the fade and the glow and all sorts of things. I really recommend checking those out. Jason himself has got a code pen, uh, uh, his account up there, which is showing lots of his examples that he showed yesterday. Um, before I go on, I just want to have a little diversion on, about icons. And icon fonts are, um, of course, everyone knows them. We have the Font Awesome collection. There are dozens and dozens of really interesting collections of, of fonts to use as icons. For many years, it's been it's always a question, what do we want to use for our icons? Fonts, or SVG, or PNG? And we think about in to total file size, number of assets we need to download whether it's scalable at the end, so how versatile are these graphics once, once we download them, or, or can they be color? So that we're thinking about all these things. Uh, that's a PNG uh, from Facebook, so that lands on your computer whenever you go to Facebook. And the neat thing about it is just one file, but by positioning it and cropping it, you get to isolate a particular icon you need. It's, it's a bitmap graphic, so it, it's not scalable. But it's a pretty efficient way of sending tiny little icons. Um, for many years, uh, it was uh, you, know, you had people arguing in favor of fonts, other people arguing in favor of C, uh, SVG. In recent years, it has become a kind of rule. The, the, the weight of the arguments seem to be settling on SVG. Here's Chris Coyer, actually the, the founder of CodePen, talking about the advantages of fonts over uh, the, the, compa the car comparison between fonts and SVG, and concludes pretty conclusively about the, the SVG. This is, uh, when was the year? This is 2014, that SVG is superior. Again, this another article concluding in favor of SVG. Another one. This is 16. This is 2018. And I'm not, I'm, I was just looking for articles and just checking the dates. I'm not selecting these for any particular ideological uh, purpose. Um, so 2018, people are wondering if now the, the, the weight of argument is swinging back towards fonts because you've got color back into fonts because of variation as well. Um, anyone know what that is? It's a horse. Um, I'll, I'll show you more of the more horses later. I'm sure you won't be surprised. Uh, anyone know what that is? Well, Senator Angus King of Maine was very excited uh, by uh, by the, that Unicode ID. Uh, it's the celebration that the lobster has been added to Unicode, and the lobster, of course, is extremely important for the Maine uh, economy. Uh, this is the. Uh, the Im image that Unicode show you, an example of how you might want to um, bring a lobster into your font. That's actually version two. Version one didn't have enough legs, someone wrote in. Uh, so. but the great thing about Unicode is it replaces all this. It's a tiny little reference in a universally understood database that replaces all this stuff. So if you can if there, is a uni if there is a Unicode for your symbol that you're encoding in your web, web page, whatever it is, it, it replaces, it's, in terms of accessibility, it's a really wonderful thing in terms of compression and, and just universal uh, accessibility. So here's my code pen. There's a few there, a couple of horses, a color one and a black and white one. Um, back in Paris, before I'd made my code pen account, this is how I showed that horse running, which you've uh, probably seen around. And, and I sort of took them through what different bits of that page were doing. There's the, the, the style part where we're bringing, bringing in the font, setting up the animation, uh, then there's a body. But I had to highlight, I had to use a sort of highlights to show what was going on. In CodePen, it's beautifully simple. So first of all, the animation is running all the time. The HTML is as simple as hell. So you've just got a single character there, the horse. So it's all ext it's extremely vivid that um, there's the con in terms of content, it's just one character. On the right, it's, it's super clear, no JavaScript is going on. On the middle, it's obvious that's where our logic is, that's where we're bringing in the font, setting up, setting up an animation. 
It's just there's something magical about this interface, I think. So I recommend if you're doing little demos, um, whether you're, um, however big your company is, then people are going to people aren't necessarily going to look at your homemade or company-made interface to work out what you're doing with your variable fonts. They are if you put them on CodePen because it is such a well-designed user interface. I want to talk a bit about animations and transitions. This is, this is another thing that has been added to CSS. These are natively built, so they're extremely fast. It's not JavaScript, so this is, some, this is a, uh, a concept that's coming into CSS. So it's sort of, therefore, in my mind, it's becoming part of typography, and so is part of the kind of stuff we should be thinking about. Uh, here's Roll's article, Silly Hover Effects. Very lighthearted, very good article uh, about the, what you can do with variable fonts in user interface design. And hover effects are they're surprisingly, uh, surprisingly common on the web. They're, they're often very subtle, and that, those are often the best ones. But to have a little hint of what a button is about to do as you get near it or hover your mouse over it is, turns out to be a really good um, user interface pattern. Uh, there's uh, nice articles introducing you to CSS, an CSS animation. Rachel Nabors wrote a nice book pretty recently. Um, and of course, you might have already you might already be animating your type specimens. That's and and that's that's really good. Um, but you're you're probably not professional animators. So even if you read books like this to understand the concept, I you're not at this level probably. Uh, the Disney Ardman kind of level. So I think just as you, if you aren't professional graphic designers, you probably want to hire a professional graphic designer to do your specimens and, and uh, material. I think you should consider hiring professional animators now that you've got, now these fonts can do all this extra stuff. It's, it might not be enough just to do a, a transition from, from light to bold. I'll spend some time on uh, irregular design spaces. And again, I th think CSS people, st they do get this stuff. It's not going over, over the top. For, um, it's not something that only the font world needs to concern itself with. So I hope yeah, that we, so we mustn't underestimate these people. Um, here's Eric Gill talking about how he was forced to uh, buy the demands of the uh, monotype uh, high ups to extend his typefaces into areas he didn't necessarily feel comfortable with. Uh, there are now a, there are now about as many different varieties of letters as there are different kinds of fools. I myself am responsible for designing five different sorts of sans serif letters, each one thicker and fatter than the last, because every advertisement has to try and shout down its neighbours. His Gil Kao, one of the fonts I think he must have been talking about. And there are some interesting differences between Gilkeo and uh, regular Gil, that I've, some of which I've uh, highlighted there. These are very different glyph structures. So we can, uh, the idea that this is a, a smooth, continuous design space certainly isn't in this case. Here's a much more prosaic example, Times. Times Bold has these different approaches to the serifs, um, and so if you're monotype deciding do you want to bring times into the variable world, you have to make some decisions. When, at what point in the design space do you flip from a diagonal serif to a horizontal serif? Or do you regularize the design? You know, there, are, do you, do you, uh, there are lots of interesting choices, and all of them come with trade-offs. How do you make um, discontinuities? There are two methods. The original one in variable fonts that was, uh, has been used and, can, and still can be used, it's still perfectly valid, is uh, the so-called GVAR method. So at a certain point in the design space, um, at one particular point, the point, the point structure, the, so the point structure stays the same, but the certain points move. Um, so the, the top left two points of that queue settle inside the outline at a certain point in the design space. There you can see more obviously what's going on. Let me, uh, as we get there. So it's still, uh, these, uh, these outlines are still compatible in the jargon. 
This is the other method. This is um, Adam Twardock's uh, Zinzin experimental font. And this gets progressively swashier as you adjust the swash axis. Um, it's not particularly usable in this form, but it's just a, a demo. So there's um, so the, these letters are switching to new forms at particular points in the in the design space, which don't need to be compatible. So it's glyph switching. And uh, recently, oops, sorry, there we are. Go back there. Uh, so these are three recent fonts that have come out that have shown uh, what can be done with uh, glyph switching. And this is probably an easier way for type designers to think about making discontinuities in the design space. This is Protipo by um, Type Together with the variation technology from uh, the, very, the G sub table built by Irini Vlaku. And you can see there's, she's chosen different jump points for three different groups of, of, the, um, of, the, of the currency and other symbols because of their you know, respecting their different structures. And the advantage of GVAR does lead to smaller files because we're not adding a whole new master. We're not adding a new set of outlines to the fonts. But RVRN method is more, is more flexible. And we can, we can change the way we, the, the jump point at any point in the design process. We can even turn it off if we, um, we, if we let users, uh, we, we can let users turn it off. I also want to think about warping the design space. So um, this is a little bit more complicated to explain, but I think I'll use some, I'm going to use some slides that I uh, used in, in Paris. And I started off by explaining how a font, uh, starting with a regular font, becomes uh, a variable font. Uh, thanks, uh, Christoph, for letting me use your winner typeface. It's great for demoing this kind of thing. Uh, so we add two masters, one at the the bold end and one at the light end to give this font a weight axis. Um, and then we get every instance in between for free. You know, not just the gray ones, but ev everything in between. That's fine. Uh, so here's some instances. Uh, you'll see there he's chosen, he hasn't chosen particularly round numbers, but that's just he's chosen, that's where he wants his light to be. And that's his, that's Christoph's right. But then it comes into conflict with this in the OS2 table specification inside OpenType, where we have these rather precise numbers for, for the weights from 100 to 900. And that's confirmed by the, on the, the CSS side. And it's, yeah, that's by, intent, by intention, that's intentionally that the numbers in the font should match numbers in CSS so we can offer CSS writers the ability to say font weight 700 and they'll get the bold. So this means we have to remap the, the numbers that occur that fall out naturally from the design space into CSS compatible numbers. So here we get the light has to be remapped from 200 to 100. Uh, sorry, that was the extra light. So there's the light, the regular from 500 down to 400, 750 to 700. And this is how we do it. We use the AVAR table. Uh, inside an open type font, it's a remapping table. Um, so that's a graphical visualization of, of the remapping. Um, and it, we, what comes out, so now, we've, now I'm setting up the, the uh, I'm just showing where those units of 100 land on from zero to 1,000. You can see they've moved around a bit from where they, it's no longer a, uh, a regular distribution. There's a two-dimensional form. So by the way, it work, that works fine if you only have one axis. If you have two axes, then these values obviously just, they, they just apply around the whole design space. But that's not necessarily how a font, a font designer would think. He might want that as his width axis. And AVAR doesn't work. So there's been some discussion about how to introduce AVAR in multiple dimensions doing this kind of thing to your design space. And that's, that's feasible. It could, be, it could, in theory, be added to, to OpenType. Um, and, and that probably should happen. There are plenty of very good reasons for it. But should we be able to, be able to warp CSS, sorry, warp design spaces inside CSS, which seems a bit crazy at first, until we realize that people have been doing it implicitly all the time 
by choosing particular fonts within a large family, they're choosing, so here, here's an example where someone's chosen the medium of this corporate typeface to be their regular. They've chosen the extra bold to be their bold version. So this is implicitly doing a remapping. So let me just express that in numbers now. So normal means 400, it's, it's, it's an alias for 400. Bold is an alias for 700. So we're setting up positions in a design space which are different from those that the font designer intended. So uh, there's a little bit of concern, and we're taking away a bit of control from, from the CSS world back into the font world. I mean, there are, there are ways of overriding it, but it's not necessarily as elegant as it could be. So we need to, need to watch that. Um, just mention one, one or two words about animation and continuity. Back to the AVAR table. Um, animation, we want it to we want it to be smooth. The more jumps we, put, the more bumps we put in this line, the less smooth our animations are going to be. If you think of animating from zero to a thousand, every time there's a, a sharp angle, we're going to notice that. It, um, the, 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 uh, the human vision system is is um, sensitive to to this kind of thing. So, again, if we're going to animate things, we maybe want to keep those lines straight and maybe also avoid sudden jumps from one form to another. Uh, now the obligatory Amstelvar uh, section. Uh, so here's Amstelvar in Axis Praxis. And I, what I thought I'd do in this little animation was just choose, just click the random button. So this, the random button in Axis Praxis chooses a random selection, random settings on every axis. And the, the scary thing is that there was only about two out of 30 uh, settings, in, if you apply them randomly, that made any sense. So does it make sense to add safety nets to fonts that we that disallow users from doing this, this stuff? Um, and one standard way of doing it, you might think, is to add Glyphs that add glyphs at particular places it, that block propagation of an axis. So we could stop that region at the top right from ever happening by choosing some of those glyphs that are just near it to be continued into the corners. That's it adds space, which is uh, reduces one of the great advantages of variable fonts. And sometimes we want to play without a safety net. You know, if you're um, if you're um, if you're animating and you want to just go a little bit over for, one, for a particular reason, if you're in multiple dimensions, it's then a bit arbitrary which master you choose to extend into that corner. What was the most systematic font of all time um, until Lucas de Groot? It was Adrian Frutiger's uh, Universe. So he, you might think, what would, what would he do in these, uh, in these corners of his design space? Would he move the light into the corner? Would he move the condensed bowl into the bottom right corner? I don't think he would. These are deliberately left empty. To, to check how this kind of thing might work out, I put, made a little uh, variable font just with one character in it, in glyphs, uh, set up the uh, weight and width axes for all the masters, and it comes out like this. Now. The top left and bottom right are things that are ugly. I never want my users to, to have access to those, ideally. They'll complain. Um, so what might I do to, to prevent that? Uh, well, here's a clue. In the title, stinkende tofu. Uh, it's a, uh, in the font world, tofu is a bad thing. It's a missing glyph idea. But I think it, it could be a valid thing to do. So here's a font that actually works this way. This, is actually, this actually works. Um, uses the RVRN method of substitution in two dimensions. So it's checking uh, two conditions. Uh, is it beyond this in the weight axis, above this in the width axis? Um, I think this could be a really nice way of doing things. Um, and uh, we might ask what Adrian Frutica would say about this if someone demanded that all positions in the design space should produce a, a usable font. I think he might say something like this. Well, I don't know if he spoke German. Um, or, um, 
let them eat tofu. Let they, if they chose a crazy place in the design space, show them it's not going to work. Of course, Chrome doesn't really like to serve tofu. So in Chrome, just by the virtue of mapping it to not def, which is the missing glyph, Chrome realizes, oh, I have to do fallback now. So that is showing times, because uh, the fallback of this, I, I didn't specify it, so it's gone to default as times. I think this actually, it is actually brilliant behavior of Chrome. It doesn't work in Safari, um, but I think this, uh, this, is, this is good. Uh, just thought I'd mention a few new things that have been happening in Access Praxis. Just got a new um, specimen the other day. Uh, the first one with a height axis. Uh, so this is a Chinese font from Founder. And it's successfully addressing the, the, the height of each glyph. So the, the vertical advance width, the vertical base point and the vertical advance width are, are moving around. And it's very successful. This is uh, Safari. It doesn't work in Chrome. So this is using CSS uh, writing mode uh, vertical. Uh, sorry, I wanted to just flip to Access Practice for a second. Uh, you got that? Let me let me just uh, mirror that. Right. A uh, couple more things I want to show you. There's a, another specimen, Gnomon, which is pretty cool. This uh, adjusts the shadow distance and the time of day. From, goes from 6 to 18, which is a nice, nice uh, range. Uh, added a resources page. So this I'm showing uh, 102 different places to find out about variable fonts, but goes going back to 1994. Um, I hope you enjoy that. Uh, what else did I want to show you? The oh yeah, fairly recently I added these uh, these font feature settings controls. So these are useful for you know, even if. So you can use this for regular fonts, actually, just checking what features you've got in the font. So, uh, and CSS lets you leave things as default or turn them explicitly off, which is uh, handy. Let me show you uh, Protipo. Uh, if we look down here at this line with the jumps, we can... By default, RVRN, the jumping uh, feature, is on. We can turn it explicitly off. And uh, let's, let's make that bold. Uh, oh, hang on. Well, that seems not to be working. I'm not sure why. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, saf a Safari Chrome thing. Yeah, that's supposed to switch off RVRN, the, the jumping thing. Uh, Show one more thing on Protipo. Uh, this isn't actually new, but I clearly didn't do a very good publicity job uh, back in November 2016 when I, uh, I got this working. And it's a way of um, adjusting the weight of a font without it adjusting the width. So it's running through behind the scenes 15 uh, iterations of a binary search algorithm to find the setting on the width axis that makes the weight make sense and the text box not um, not change in width. So there we are. We add it. And we can see the CSS that it's working out in real time, and 15 seems to be a decent uh, number of iterations. Um, I just fired my publicity department for uh, not letting people know about that. Um, right, one more thing I wanted to show you is this thing. I call, I call it SAMHSA, and it's for debugging variable fonts and visualizing them. I'm not sure which direction to take it, but I just want to show you uh, some stuff in it. So here's, let's uh, load Skier. It's showing this list of these are all the del so-called delta tuples. So each one of these is a, is a, let's go to a simple glyph first of all. So each one of these says what to do in a particular region of the design space. And we can really see what's happening. 
and we can uh, see what's happening with that famous Q. And we see that we can see that by the delta tuples that are highlighted in green, if you know your GVAR, um, how many people here know their GVAR? Well, okay, handful, that's good. So uh, you can see which tuples are active at any point in the design space. Which, so I think this kind of thing could be very handy for debugging, maybe even editing variable fonts. So going in at a particular point in the design space, shifting things, shifting things over. Uh, there's, uh, I just want to show you one more font in there. So here's the dear old horse. And we can see that how that interpolates between, it's always interpolating between two masters. And that's really quite vividly expressed there, I think. So if you're interested in license, licensing this or uh, sponsoring it to become open source, then that would be, uh, be great. Um, another feature, that, the final feature that I that really ought to get a bit more use is uh, is this page. It's really great. I, I um, recommend checking it out. Um, repays uh, a repeated visits as well. Uh, okay. So CSS is expanding typography step by step. It's slow. They're not writing a single app that just has to fulfill one function on one uh, one computer. It's writing a specification that any application developer, any browser maker uh, can follow, and we can ex this is typography. So this is um, a conversation with web designers is really, really helpful, I think. We have a lot to learn from them. Don't assume they are learning from us. We have a lot to learn from them. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>